This is my perfect audience. You're all drunk. So. <laughs> This is the official title of what we're going to talk about tonight. It's a shit title. Here's the real title. <laughs> You've just heard a fantastic lecture about all the ways to keep in a cognitive green zone. What we're going to talk about in my talk is all the people that put you into the red. So. This is John Hines. He was a friend of mine. He was an anesthetist and intensivist. And he, uh, he died after the last smack doing what he loved to do, which is ride motorcycles at incredible speed. Um, and at, at a talk at the last smack, John, uh, John talked about performing a thoracotomy at his hospital. It was the first thoracotomy that had been performed in like a decade. Uh, at that place, and despite the fact that they did everything perfectly, uh, he actually titled the talk, How to Get Crucified Performing a Thoracotomy. And from that talk emerged the term recess wanker. And I'll let John introduce it. Wankers are the people that even if you brought a style chest that they would still insist that this is a top procedure. These people are best treated with basic life support and drama. Wankers either understand the evidence and attention but criticize you anyway, or they're just stupid to understand. This, I think, is the appropriate hashtag. <laughs> if you could get this trending, I'd be impressed. <laughs> Feel free to drop it into all future talks and conversations. So that was the last time John gave a talk on the big stage. And um, I, I, in tribute to him, created this lecture to actually talk about the recess wankers we have to deal with on an everyday basis in emergency medicine and critical care. And so this lecture is a tribute to him. So recess wanker, it's a fantastic term. It sells. But the problem is it's not really polite. You know, there's some delicate ears in the room. So I wanted to come up with something that we could talk about in, in more, you know, urbane company. So I, I created a new acronym to go along with recess wanker. And it's it's an acronym I, I kind of like. It's Silly Human Impediments to Timely and Excellent Resuscitation. So obviously, the acronym is S-Hitter. Um, <laughs> so we're going to talk about the S-Hitters tonight. And John's call sign when he was at the races, being the medical doctor for these uh, incredibly insane motorcyclists, uh, was Delta 7. And, and that's the perfect uh, setting for this talk, because these are going to be seven people that need to change to make our profession more functional. So delta seven, change of seven types. And so let's talk about the first kind of recess wanker. And this is the one you're going to actually see most commonly. Let me just fix the audio here. OK, these are the wrong but strongers. And this was actually first described by a group of psychologists. And the uh, lead authors of the paper were Dunning and Kruger. And they wrote a fantastic paper, a paper I think all of you should actually read in its entirety. It's called Unskilled and Unaware of It. How difficulties in recognizing one's own incompetence lead to inflated self-assessments. This is a legitimate <laughs> academic paper. And what they found is, is also embodied by this quote by Charles Darwin. Ignorance more frequently begets confidence than it does knowledge. Now, I'm not, we're not specifically talking about surgeons, but they may, <laughs> they may be something I focus on during this uh, portion of the lecture. Um, when I was in grade school, my teacher asked me to define evil. And in my naivete, I said evil is a combination of arrogance and ignorance. And yet, the longer I practice, the more I keep coming back to this definition. This is evil. If you track down any badness in the world, these two are always at play. Because either one individually is fine, but when you put them together, horror is the result. And the real problem, the reason this comes about, is I think best exemplified by a quote from that actual article. I'm going to read it. An ignorant mind is precisely not a spotless, empty vessel. 
but one that's filled with the clutter of irrelevant or misleading life experiences, theories, facts, intuitions, algorithms, heuristics, and hunches that regrettably have the look and feel of accurate information. That's just perfect. That's what happens is they, they just see, we just see silliness and it somehow gets incorporated and then through the magic of something called confirmation bias, it gets reinforced. Well, what is confirmation bias? So some ridiculous chief resident in general surgery says to one of their junior regs, if you go to the emergency department and you flick the patient they're trying to convince you has appendicitis right in their right little quadrant like this and they yelp, then it, they're probably right. But if they don't, they're not. And so they get called down for something you've already seen on CT scan and they flick them and the patient yelps and they're like, huh. That works. And they, they have that happen three or four more times. You calm down because the CT shows appendicitis. And then they now believe that this is a good test. And the few times they tried it on a patient and they didn't yelp, well, that just gets ignored because the magic of confirmation bias will have them reinforcing the things they believe and ignoring or not even noticing the things they don't. And that's how this Dunning-Kruger phenomenon comes about. Try to teach a second year medicine registrar or resident anything. I, I had one a few weeks ago. I had a DKA patient, pH of 7.1. And they were trying to convince me that I had to give this patient sodium bicarb. And when I tried to explain all the physiologic reasons I didn't feel that was right, she actually rolled her eyes. <laughs> and this is not uncommon because after all, second year internal medicine doctors know everything. Um, and, and this, it's, it's one of the most frustrating things you're going to deal with in your consultants. Um, but it's really tough for self-realization to take over because the difference between bad doctors and good doctors is not that the bad ones make a bad decision every single shift or even every single week. The difference between a bad doctor and a good doctor may be one bad decision a month. And that's really hard to get self-realized feedback on. There are not enough occurrences of real objective badness to learn from one's mistakes. So what do you call someone who's been a bad doctor for 15 years? Professor or consultant, <laughs> right? I'm not saying all professors are bad. I'm simply saying that if you do that for long enough in our practice of medicine, you're eventually going to progress. It's just the natural course of things. There's very, it's very difficult to get bad doctors out. And there's very little feedback to make them aware of how they're doing. So what is the solution to this first recess wanker situation? Surprisingly, the solution comes from a very similar situation, which is driving. How many folks in the room are above average drivers? <laughs> Come on, be brave, be legit. All men in the friggin' room need to raise their hand because none of you believe you're bad drivers. But when you do the surveys, at least in the States, you guys might be more self-aware, 93% um, of people think they have above average driving skills, which besides being mathematically impossible, you know from being on the road, certainly not true. So this is what people think because they realize, well, I haven't had an accident for four years. I'm a great driver. But you know what the difference between a good driver and a bad driver is? One accident a decade. That's how many you're entitled to as a good driver. If you've had more than that, you're a horrible driver <laughs> who happens to be lucky for most of the time. And that's how most people go through medicine as well. They haven't had a horrible outcome for over a year. They must be a good doctor. But there were so many other mistakes that were subliminal, that weren't quite noticed by the system where they were making bad decisions. So the solution could come from driving as well. Because this you know, young lady feels she's an excellent driver. This young man feels he's an excellent driver. When I was 18, the fact that I am still alive is a testament to the, the, uh, the way cars are built for safety because I was the worst driver in the world. But if you asked me at the time, I would have said I was excellent. So what did they do? 
the insurance companies actually did an experiment. They took these people who said they were excellent drivers and they mounted a dash cam on their car. And then they just sat down with them and showed them all the instances where they were abysmal at their driving. They just cut that guy off and nearly killed a family of five. And they just pointed it out. And there was realization. There was finally an acknowledgment, OK, I'm not such a great driver. And that led to better driving. So this same thing could be done in emergency medicine, in critical care. You talked about the video badges. That's brilliant. Film the resuscitations and go over them. And people will realize that even though it felt wonderful, there were actually quite a few points where things were not perfect. All right, the other thing is to ask yourself, for everything you say, is it a result of something someone told you at some point in the past and that's been incorporated into your knowledge or do you actually have evidence for it? Do you actually have realistic basis for teaching this to other people? And then when you seek out evidence, don't seek out things that confirm what you already believe. Actively look for the things that go against your beliefs. Read those more assiduously than the things that support you and see, are you right in your, in your thoughts or should you change? And then, especially in emergency medicine, but in all critical care, actually follow up on your patients and see how often you're right. Do a little self-experiment and see how many angiograms of the chest you ordered for PE actually turned out to be positive. It's kind of eye-opening in the States. You folks have a better radiological use in the UK. But getting that follow-up and finding out whether what you did actually turned out the way you thought is amazingly potent. All right. Recess wanker number two. The name badge believers. This is something I call specialty name bias. It's the belief that because you are in a specialty, you somehow represent the best version of that specialty. <laughs> that if your name badge says anesthetist, you are the best intubator in the hospital. And you might very well be, but it's not because of what your name badge says. If your name badge says emergency medicine does not mean you are the best person to take care of emergencies. You might be, but not because your name badge says it. And what I've noticed more and more throughout my career is that you cannot judge anything by any generic representation. Each doctor, unfortunately, needs to be judged on their own merits. So if you, as an emergency doctor or an intensivist, can't get a difficult airway and the patient winds up vomiting and aspirating and has a horrible course, what do they say? So you're an idiot, right? But if this second year anesthetist registrar comes down, can't get the airway, the patient aspirates, winds up in the ICU, what do they say? Damn, that was a really tough airway, right? And that's specialty name bias at work. And it's really difficult to counter because we're supposed to be able to believe the specialty names. But I just haven't found it to be true. And so specialty name means very little. Each doctor needs to be judged on their own merits. And you have to work to be the exemplar of your specialty. And unfortunately, in emergency medicine, we've diluted down what our name badge even means. Right? We, we call ourselves emergency doctors. But yet most of what we see is no longer emergency. It's no longer sick patients. So then we have to ask ourselves, when we look down, what does our name badge actually represent? And that's a problem. It's a problem for our specialty in the United States. It's a problem for our specialty, I think, in most of the world. Because what we want to be able to do is have the specialty name bias work for us. You look down, and people think, this is the person I want in an emergency. This is the person, when I look down and see critical care, I'd want taking care of the sickest of patients. And yet, that's not what's represented in our daily practice. That's just something to think about. All right, the third recess wanker the water torturers. Doc, could this patient have some paracetamol? Doc, could this patient have some pain meds? Doc, could this patient eat? Doc, could this patient walk to the bathroom on their own? Doc, is this patient allowed to be in left lateral recumbent? Doc, could this patient have two extra blankets? These are all incredibly important questions. But they're not necessarily questions that should be asked of the senior reg, of the consultants. Why? I mean, it's perfectly logical 
that the nurses are going to want to ask this, especially in my country where the practice of nursing has been diminished in terms of whatever independent thought they used to be able to have, they're no longer. They need an order for everything. But this is a big problem. Why is it a big problem? Well, each of these drips and drops, each of these minor things you have to make a decision on actually prevents you from deciding the big stuff. It's called decision fatigue, and it might not be something you intuit as being true. You might say, oh, come on, I could have made those hundred minor decisions and then still be perfectly cognitively available for the big ones. But that's not what the evidence shows. That's not what the scientific literature shows. What it seems, if you actually look at the science, is every decision, no matter how minor, steals from a non-replenishable reservoir for that period of time. You only have so many decisions in you for a shift, whether they're great, big, important ones, do we send this patient home or not, should we intubate now or not, or can this patient drink a glass of water? You have a finite limit. We perform in a cognitive maelstrom, both in the ICU and in the emergency department. We are bombarded with thousands of things we could make decisions on. I refuse to make decisions on most of them. I refer them to my intern. I refer them to themselves and say, whatever you want to do, I will support you. Because I want to save. I want to save those decisions. We only have a limited number. Now, you could watch this happen in the emergency department. As you get towards the end of your shift, that patient you might have considered really deciding on, you know, on a razor's edge, maybe they could go home, let's see how they develop, let's watch. Obviously here in the UK you can only watch for three hours and 59 minutes, but, <laughs> but you might have sent some of these patients home that towards the end of the shift you're like, screw it, just put them in the observation unit, just admit them, because you don't have the brain power left. But you actually want objective evidence, I think. So let's go to another field. Let's go to parolees. In front of a parole board, in front of a judge, who has to decide whether this potentially dangerous to society person should be let go before the end of their sentence. And this study was actually done in Israel, but I have no doubt it's the same everywhere. And so this is graph on the vertical axis is how many of these parolees were let go before the end of their full sentence. And on the horizontal is just how many cases in to the docket of each day they were. So the first case, the second case, the third case. Now look at this. You start off with a 60 or 70 percent release rate. Obviously it's average, but you know, right in that range. And then even though it pops up and pops down, it keeps progressively going down until the fourth or fifth case of the day. What happens at that point? Yeah, well, you're, you have the drinky, drinky motion, but hopefully they're not doing that. But yes, they go out to lunch. And then they come back reset, maybe not quite as high as they were at initially, but still very reasonable. And then towards the end of the day, diminishes it again. And this would be if they were doing an after dinner round as well. This is decision fatigue. They will not trust themselves. They're subconsciously understanding, I don't have the mental bandwidth anymore to make these important decisions. And the default position is always the easiest to make, keep them in jail. You do not want to be the fourth case of the day if you want to get back to your family after smoking some pot on the street side. So this is what happens in emergency medicine, critical care, whether you realize it or not. You need to save your decision bandwidth. Now, part of the theory on why this is happening is glucose levels to the brain. Now, you just going and like eating some sugar does not immediately translate to a reset of those levels. It takes a while to percolate through. But what I could tell you for sure is not eating makes it a lot more likely you have less decision bandwidth. In the States, at least, we're not allowed to eat in the emergency department. We're not allowed to drink in the emergency department. Our patients are walking around in the department with like full-on fast food meals. But we, because of some infection risk, are banned from eating. Um, and it's supposed to be a patient safety measure. But because of this research on decision fatigue, I could tell you definitively it is not. Are you folks allowed to eat while you're on shift? Not in a break room, leaving your department as it's going to hell. Are you allowed to eat in the department? Yeah. OK, so you're, yet again, more advanced than us. <laughs> this is federal statute. <laughs> All right, so how do you counter this? Well, obviously eat. 
Um, but then prioritize and delegate decisions. There's no reason that you have to make, as you get to the more senior levels, every single decision in the department. You know, they seek us out because we're you know, able to give definitive answers, but those definitive answers come at a cost. And what I try to do is give back the power to nursing. They're fantastic. They're actually at the bedside. If they feel the patient needs more pain medication, knock yourself out. You know better than me. If you want to know if the patient is allowed to walk around the department, use your judgment. Okay, number four, the EKG thrusters. Doc, can you look at this EKG? Can you look at this EKG? Can you look at this? E I know you're taking a dump, but can you look at this EKG? So, why is this a problem? Why is this a problem? The problem is task interruption. You cannot maintain the thought you had before someone thrust an EKG in front of you after you looked at that EKG. It's gone. Now, most of the time, you were thinking about what you want for lunch that day. No problem. But if you're doing something that's absolutely critical and you have a task interruption, what can result is what is called in the cognitive literature slips. And this actually, this word has a real defined meaning. A slip is an error that takes place in a non-novice. Slips are what could happen in even the most expert of folks. Slips occur when they, something that has become an unconscious task gets interrupted. But because it's unconscious, you have no idea that you actually missed a step. So how do wires get lost when placing central lines? Yes, some of them are due to real junior people who are unsupervised. But in my experience, a vast majority of them actually occur when people who are quite good and know better have some subtle task interruption. And they have fully automated the removal of that wire in their way of performing the procedure. And when they get interrupted, that disappears. And they have no ability to make that unconscious conscious. And they don't even know. So they were at the point where they're feeding the line over to get the wire to pop out of the back. And then all of a sudden, someone says, oh, can you look at this EKG? And they look down. They see the line. There's no wire coming out of the back. Done. All right? No one's going to notice it. And what's really horrible is when the wire is eventually found two days later, they're not even going to remember the task interruption. They're just going to think they're a horrible doctor. All right, so these are dangerous. This is known in other domains that this is dangerous. In the aviation world, they have a concept called sterile cockpit. When you hit below 10,000 feet, no one's allowed to talk about anything extraneous. Everything needs to be pure, by rote, protocolized discussion. There's no extraneous conversation because they understand the problems of someone just, oh, you got to see this movie at just the wrong time, plane goes down. Sterile cockpit is what should be happening in critical care as well during tasks like intubation, during tasks like central line placement, during tasks like sign out of the department, which we treat in such a blasé manner in most places in emergency medicine, and yet it's probably the most important thing that's going on. And then the nurses have realized this. This is actually a patient safety measure that's at least taken hold in the states. When nurses are preparing infusions or mixing up drugs, they usually, if you're in a really good place with clinical governance, lock the door of the medication room. No one's coming in until they finish that mix. Because they know task interruption during that leads to tenfold errors in insulin, leads to the wrong concentration of pediatric drugs. So if they're doing it, we should be doing it as well. All right, the fifth recess wanker, the leadership encroachers. Now, this is less relevant to ICU because they've already solved this problem. At least in the States, most ICUs are what we call closed units, which means even though there's multiple other consultants rendering opinions, there may even be a primary team when I work in surgical critical care, all those decisions flow through one person, the intensivist. And they will factor in all the opinions, factor in the feelings of the primary team, but also factor in unit logistics, factor in their own bedside observations of the patient. And they are the ultimate people who could write orders on patients in the ICU. 
That same situation needs to take place in the emergency department. But when we come down and have a sick trauma patient, there's seven people who think in their minds that they are leading this situation. They are feeling that the trauma surgeons are in control and the nurses take orders from them. The anesthetist is in control and the nurses take order from them. And then the emergency uh, consultant is there and the nurses are taking, that doesn't work. Nature abhors a vacuum, leadership abhors a vacuum, but leadership abhors plurality as well. There could only be one leader. <laughs> Which is not to say there's only one person contributing, not to say only one person, even giving true dictatorial mandates. Like if the surgeon feels now's the time to go to the OR, I'm not going to be the one to tell them no. Absolutely. That is something they could tell. But me orchestrating that move, that's what's going to happen. They're not going to say pack everything up, go, because then things like ventilators getting unhooked from the wall and patients' ET tubes getting pulled out occur. So it's not to say the emergency doctor has to make all the decisions. They have to orchestrate all the decisions. We have a resuscitation mindset in critical care. That's what we bring to the table. If you want to look down at your name badge and see what emergency medicine should bring, it's a resuscitative mindset. It's the fact that no matter how stressful the situation, we should be the person in the room that remains calm. That's why we should be orchestrating care. That's why the intensivists should be orchestrating care in the ICU, because those specialties have the right mindset to take care of patients. You have people who, when they get stressed, start yelling and screaming. They're not the person who should be orchestrating care. So this concept of the closed unit should be part of emergency medicine, just like it is part of intensive care. All right, number six. And these are the people that hurt me the most. Slothful and avoidant. He's too sick to operate on. He's too sick to scope. Does anyone know the patient that is the proper level of sick to get an upper endoscopy? I, I, I still been practicing 12 years, I don't quite know. He's too sick to anesthetize. I thought this was the way it is. It drove me nuts. When I, uh, when I did my initial emergency training, um, this was told to me all the time. And I watched patients die in the emergency department time after time. And I thought that's just the way it is, that you're not supposed to take sick patients to the operating room, that you're not supposed to perform endoscopy on exsanguinating GI hemorrhage because Obviously, if there's a chance they could die during that procedure, we can't have that happen. And this is how I thought it was, because this is how it was across all the hospitals that I had worked at when I was in my training. And then I went to fellowship at a place called the Shock Trauma Center in Baltimore, where their entire hospital is built only to take care of sick patients. And there, their motto was, the best place for a sick patient is in the operating room. In fact, the chair of anesthesia at the shock trauma center at the time, a guy named Rick Dudden, he said, why wouldn't we want them in the OR? It's a one attending to one patient intensive care unit. Where else could they get better care when they're really sick than an operating room? You go to an ICU, it's one attending to 12 patients. I get six hours to actively resuscitate this patient. And that was their feeling. And if a patient died on the OR table, then the physician in chief, Tom Scalia said, good on you for getting that patient where they had the best chance to live. Which is not to say you shouldn't avoid the OR as much as possible if there is something better you could offer. Don't perform a cholecystectomy for a severe sepsis patient who's incredibly unstable on three inotropes when you could put in a perk drain and temporize the situation. But there's some patients, like the ones with dead gut, where there is nothing to temporize except getting it out. And there's no patient in my mind that's too sick for that to happen. And if they die on the OR table, so be it. At least you gave them a shot. All right, so the only thing that I feel and that the people that taught me feel should determine whether you provide maximally aggressive care is the pre-morbid state of the patient. If you have a 95-year-old patient demented from a nursing home, don't take them to the OR. But if you have a 55-year-old father or mother with three kids, there's nothing that should stand in the way of giving them every possible chance. All right, number seven. This one, unfortunately, is unfixable. 
It's people that are just plain dicks. <laughs> now, if they're bad doctors too, then just fire them. That's easy. The problem is there's a whole category in the medical administration world. They actually have a name for it. It's called competent bastards. Now, I know that's not a gender neutral term, but let's admit it, most of them are male. And the, the bastard part, not the competent part. Um, but there's a huge group of people, surgeons, um, who, while have no capability of interacting with other human beings, um, are incredibly good at their job. And it would be really difficult to get rid of them because they're doing what you hired them for as a hospital administrator. And so when you have this solution, uh, with this problem, the solution is you fire them when they're bad or you proxy them when they're providing a real service. And I have this happen in all sorts of hospitals. And no one says it outright, but you know it's happening. When you never actually talk to that surgeon, you talk to a very kind physician assistant or nurse practitioner, and they're the only person allowed to interact with other services, and they relay the information to the actual surgeon. And this is a real solution. Um, one person was telling me a story where they hired one of these mid-level providers not to be the proxy, but just to go around after they've s showed up on the ward or in the emergency department to apologize. <laughs> And, and that was really their, their main role, was just, I'm so sorry, he's a really good surgeon, he's just not good with people. That works too. Um, but these people are really tough, and if you ever had to deal with one, uh, fighting them is like the worst possible thing. That's just fuel. They just, they just get happier and happier. Um, so they're, they're unfixable, but if providing a service, you can't do anything about them. All right. So we'll have time for a little uh, bit of question and answer in a second. Let's, let's just bring it all home. Uh, if you want to hear more about this stuff and you're not listening, the MCRIT podcast is totally free. Um, and you can always hit me up on Twitter with any questions we don't get to tonight. So let's bring it all home. So we talked about seven S hitters. We talked about the Dunning-Kruger effect, the people that are wrong and strong, and the fact that novices are often more confident in their ability than experts. Expertise breeds humility. And being at the beginning of your career often breeds a very false overconfidence. Don't believe your name badge. There's no name badge that tells you how good a doctor is at pretty much anything. And yes, we can make averages based on specialty, but those averages can't be applied to an individual, both for good or for bad. So you just have to judge each doc on their own merits. Decision fatigue is definitively real. And if you take nothing else from this talk, take the fact that you only have a limited number of decisions in you for any set period of time. So don't waste them on the silly stuff. The pilots have created the sterile cockpit. We need the sterile resus bay. For really patient critical tasks, there should be no task interruptions. Unless, you know, three other patients have just fallen into a hole that's opened as a result of an earthquake, let us finish the intubation before any task interruptions. All right, nature abhors a vacuum and plurality and leadership is the same way. There could be only one. It's not to say that leader is making all the decisions, but they should be the one who's putting all those decisions into effect. All right, the only deaths should be with maximally aggressive care at all times. And that maximally aggressive care could be curative or it could be maximally aggressive comfort care. But there's no half-assed measures in the world I want to practice medicine in. All right, and then some people are just bad apples. You can't fix them. If you could find a way not to have to deal with them or to just fire them, then make it happen. All right, we are resuscitationists, whether you come from emergency medicine, critical care, ICU, pre-hospital. There's nowhere outside of those specialties that is more stressful, that where you have to make more really patient critical decisions every day during your job. Don't let these S hitters crap all over your recess. Or what John would tell us is avoid at all costs the recess wankers. And with that, I thank you for your attention.